What's going on guys, my name is Matt and welcome to part 2 of my newest sleeper PC build. In the first video I went in depth into the mod itself, water cooling, and the parts used. In this episode I'm going to be talking about overclocking, show you some benchmarks, and go more in depth on a few of the mods that I kind of glossed over in the last video. I'll be testing both 4K gaming and a few synthetic tests like Puget Systems Premiere Pro Benchmark and actually be putting this system head to head against my current personal rig to see how it stacks up. If if you haven't seen part 1 then I would highly recommend pausing this video and heading over to that one so you can get all the way caught up. With that being said I'll briefly go over this system now. So this is a sleeper PC I recently built and is the first system I've ever custom water cooled. I made it so I could have both a stealth mode with all the lights turned off and the original side panel on, but I also made a custom magnetic side panel for when you want to see the internals and all of those RGB lights. This is a Ryzen 9 3900X based system with 32 gigs of Corsair Vengeance Pro RGB RAM. The motherboard is an ASUS Prime X570P. I'm using a 2080 Super for graphics and a 1TB NVMe drive for storage. In terms of the power supply, I'm using a Corsair RM750 and it's all inside this decade old Lenovo S30 chassis. One of the other mods I'm proud of is the custom cable management basement I made which I'll explain more about later. Again, I went over the whole process of making this PC and gave the rationale for each of the parts in the first video. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about overclocking. I'm honestly a very novice overclocker so I knew I wasn't going to be able to get the absolute most out of this system, but I did put some time into trying to get some extra performance. For this CPU I just decided to only enable precision boost overdrive and auto OC. This gets you like 95% of what you can possibly get out of the CPU. This basically allows the system to dynamically overclock the CPU based on stuff like power limits and temps. I saw it boost up to 4.2 GHz across all cores under a full load and boost up to 4.3 GHz under a gaming load. For the GPU I manually overclocked it using MSI Afterburner. The settings I landed on were a core voltage of 25%, a power limit of 112% which was maxed out, a core clock of plus 120 MHz, and a memory clock of plus 500 MHz. I probably could have got more out of it, but even with the simple GPU overclock, I saw a 7.5% increase in performance in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. In terms of temps, with both the CPU and GPU under full load for an extended period of time, the CPU maxed out in the upper 70s and the GPU maxed out in the upper 50s. For only running on a single 360mm radiator, these results are decent in my opinion. Under a more normal gaming load, I saw the CPU stay in the upper 50s and the GPU stay in the mid to upper 40s most of the time. Speaking of temps, to cool the system I used a fully custom loop comprised of Corsair Hydro X parts with hardline tubing. I'll have a link to all these products and parts in the description if you want to check them out, and for a more in-depth look at each of these water cooling components you can refer back to part 1. For benchmarking, I use gaming and synthetic benchmarks. Let's go ahead and start with the gaming benchmarks. This is my first time testing a system at 4K, so I wasn't entirely sure what to expect. I just went with four games that had built-in benchmarks so I could keep things very repeatable. Let's start out with Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 4K max settings. Using the built-in benchmark, the system produced a 66 FPS average when overclocked, which is a decent improvement over the 61 FPS average it received at stock GPU settings. It's impressive to see that this PC can max out a game like Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 4K at over 60 FPS average. Moving on to GTA 5, which is a game I haven't benchmarked in a while and one that I just wanted to see how this system would perform in. I tested at 4K with basically everything turned up to max settings. Using the built-in benchmark, the system produced an overall average of 74 FPS which is awesome to see. This game was pretty hard to run back in the day and seeing a system max it out at 70 plus FPS in 4K is pretty cool. Moving on of Far Cry 5, again at 4K max settings using the built-in benchmark, the system received a 65 FPS average. Again, it's great to see this performance at these settings. Finally, Borderlands 3 was the only game that really disappointed me performance-wise. I tested at 4K high settings, which is one step below max, and used the built-in benchmark. Even though I did step the settings down a bit, the system still only received a 47 FPS average, which definitely isn't ideal, and shows that some games are a little too much for this system at 4K with high settings. Overall, gaming performance is great. I personally don't game at 4K and would much rather use the system at 1440p 144Hz instead of 4K60 which is definitely doable if you turn a few settings down and don't play at absolute max. 
I did three more synthetic benchmarks which include Cinebench, 3D Mark Time Spy, and Puget Systems Premiere Pro Benchmark. For these I wanted to compare them head to head with my personal rig as this sleeper PC may be replacing it. Currently I have a Ryzen 7 2700, 32GB of 3200MHz RAM, and a GTX 1070 Ti. The system works well, but I was interested to see how it stacks up to the sleeper PC. Starting off with Cinebench which is a purely CPU dependent test, the sleeper PC received a score of 7107, and my personal rig received a score of 4044. As you can see, this is a big step up performance wise, but keep in mind this is going from an 8 core CPU to a 12 core CPU. With that being said, there is a 75% performance increase with only a 50% increase in cores. For 3D Mark Time Spy, which is meant to test gaming performance, this sleeper PC received a score of 12,299. This is a big jump up from the 6933 my personal rig got. Finally, I tested Puget Systems Premiere Pro benchmark. This tests how well a system will perform in Premiere Pro. If you like this benchmark and like to see it in the future, let me know in the comments section below. This sleeper PC received an overall score of 873. This is compared to my personal rig score of 542. This is a 61% increase in performance, and comparing the score online, I found this competitive with some of the most high-end systems tested with this benchmark. If there are other workstation benchmarks you'd like to see me use in the future, let me know in the comments below. Overall, performance on this system is great in both gaming and workstation tasks like video editing, which is something I do all the time. I think that this system could benefit a fair amount from an extra 240mm radiator because the components are so power hungry, but honestly temps weren't that bad in my opinion. With the benchmarks out of the way, I want to go over more in depth about a few of the mods that I didn't go into great detail about in the first video. These are the side panel window and the cable management basement. Let's start by talking about the side panel. This is a method that anyone can do to make their PC that has a solid side panel have a window, and it's relatively cheap, easy to do, and doesn't require a bunch of tools. There's also no modifications needed to be made to the case because it just attaches with magnets. One side note is this won't work on aluminum cases because the magnets won't stick but most cases are made of steel anyway. For this panel, I needed a thin sheet of clear acrylic, some magnet tape, and something to make a border. Some people use paint, I used vinyl. Basically, I laid out my sheet of acrylic and measured out the two cuts I'd need to make the perfect side panel. The best method I found is to score and snap it. They make specific scoring tools which make the process a lot easier, but I used a regular box cutter with a few razor blades which did take a little while but worked fine. I used a straight edge and held it in place with a few clamps and then ran the blade over this line a few dozen times. Clamping this in place made it easy to make a repeatable line, but if you're careful you could always hold it in place with one hand and cut with the other. Once the line is scored pretty deep, I took it to the edge of the table and snapped it. The first time I did it, I went a little too slow and had to break it off in multiple pieces, but with future attempts I went with a faster snapping motion and that worked well. Once the panel was cut down to size, it was now time to make it so it could mount to the case. I used this magnet tape that has adhesive on one side. I just cut down four pieces and applied them to the edge of the acrylic. This works well to keep the panel on, but looks bad from the other side, which is why I needed to make a nice looking border. Like I said before, some people use paint, but I opted to use vinyl, which I cut down into strips. This is carbon fiber look vinyl that I got pretty cheap on Amazon. It looks nice, was relatively affordable, and I was able to use it in a few parts of the build. I just removed the adhesive from these strips and laid them onto the acrylic, making sure the inside edge was as straight as possible. I did this for all four edges. The outside edge doesn't need to be perfect because I just had to cut the excess off with a box cutter. When done, I was left with a pretty good looking side panel. One of the big downsides of this is that because it is acrylic, it can scratch pretty easily, but that is what it is. The next thing I want to talk about more in depth is how I made the cable management basement, which I used some of the same techniques from the side panel window to make it. I started with a piece of angle aluminum that I cut into six pieces. I planned on using these pieces to make two U-shaped frames for the cable management shroud. With the pieces cut, I lined them up how I wanted them attached and drilled holes that went through both pieces. These holes were just big enough 
enough to fit the rivets I was using to go through. These rivets create a strong semi-permanent bond between the two pieces of metal and are the main method that manufacturers use to assemble PC cases. With the two U-shapes done, I had to score and cut two pieces of acrylic that would cover the top and front of the shroud. I used some pretty strong glue to attach the acrylic panels to the U-shaped frames. With these glued on, I needed to cover these panels because there's not much point of a shroud like this if you can see right through it. So what I decided to use was the same vinyl from the side panel window. I cut a piece that was slightly larger than what I needed. This allowed me to cover the panel easily and just made me need to trim off the excess at the end. Putting this on did require a few tries and once on, I had to remove some air bubbles. It didn't turn out perfectly, but the parts you can easily see look very nice. Overall, the cable management basement and the side panel turned out better than expected, and I'm super happy with how this system turned out as a whole. I honestly don't know if there will be a part 3 of this build, but if there were to be, let me know what you'd want to see in the comment section below. Overall, I'm very happy with how this system looks and performs, being able to game at 4K and being able to edit videos like a dream. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and consider subscribing for more PC and tech related content in the future. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.